In 1828, after four of the most miserable years of his life as president, John Quincy Adams was up for re-election. He probably knew he was going to lose. He definitely knew he was going to lose. But out of a matter of pride, he insisted on running. He did not run with his current vice president, John C. Calhoun. Instead, he ran with a guy named Richard Rush. So the National Republicans are John Quincy ha John Quincy Adams and Richard Rush versus Andrew Jackson and his vice presidential candidate was John Quincy Adams' current vice president, John C. Calhoun. Calhoun, remember, he was, he was looking for the best path to the presidency. The election of 1828 is important because it is the first time we see what are called modern electoral techniques. And modern electoral techniques mean three big things. First, mass appeal, you know, what we would now call get out the vote. Just get out everyone as excited as you can and get them out. If you are getting as many people out as you possibly can, and you, that's your goal is just to get be as appealing to as many people as you can, it is very important that you avoid issues. Uh, every election, people discover that candidates are not running on issues, and this goes back a long time, 1828, well, before that, 1824. If you remember, Jackson had no issues, and he won uh, the most popular in electoral votes. Uh, Americans insist they want issues, but we really don't. They could have been talking about some really important things, slavery, uh, protective tariff, banking, uh, the second bank of the United States. But do people really want to hear about banking? Also, if you talk about issues, you can piss people off. So it's best to avoid them if you're running for president. Uh, there's t so many examples of, the, of this. But at one point, someone asked Jackson, Sir, where do you stand on the protective tariff? Jackson said, I'm for a judicious tariff. And everyone was like, oh, yeah, judicious tariff. That's good. That's what I'm for. Judicious means of sound mind and judgment. So what the hell is a judicious tariff? Nobody knows. So that's the first thing, mass appeal. Second, slogans pers uh, and images or personalities. Instead of running on issues, if you're going to have mass appeal, you run on things that are going to get people really excited which is slogans, images, personality. And this is an area that Jackson had a huge advantage over John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams is brilliant, but his personality is not great. Jackson, he had a huge personality. Uh, this is an actual flyer from, or a pamphlet from 1828. You can read it top to bottom, and just so you know, there is no information that will be of any use uh, in understanding any issue. Jackson forever, hero of two wars, man of the people, presidency, because people, knock down, old hickory. So they ran on slogans and images. And again, Jackson, he had a lot of personality, so he had a huge advantage. His Because his nickname was Old Hickory, his supporters would come out, and have big rallies where they'd plant hickory trees. And of course, John Quincy Adams, he had no comparable personality. Uh, you know, Adams and the National Republicans would be like, what the hell are you guys doing? And Jackson supporters, it made sense to them because it always does to the people who support the person with more personality. Uh, Jackson had a campaign slogan. Do you want to... Uh, do you support John Quincy Adams, who can write, or Andrew Jackson, who can fight? Oh my gosh, it rhymes. We love rhymes. Uh, don't think about that one too hard. Do you want a president that can fight or one that can write? You got mixed answers on this one. So they just ran on slogans and getting people excited. And again, to this day, people do the same thing and both parties do it and yet then they get all indignant when the other party does make america great again hope and change ronald reagan's campaign slogan 
let's make America great again. I mean, it's if, if you're going to win anyway, avoid issues. Just have a catchy slogan. Third thing that modern electoral techniques means, mudslinging, slandering, or just talking crap about each other. And it's not the first time this happened in U.S. history, but 1828, I used to be able to say was the dirtiest election in U.S. history, and then we've outdone ourselves. We've gotten really, really, really dirty. But for a long time, 1828 was the dirtiest election in U.S. history, probably. Jackson was, the National Republicans uh, attacked Jackson for a lot of things. One, coffin hand bill. Um, of course, the National Republicans would put something out like this. Look how many words there are. Who's going to read all that? They criticized Jackson because Jackson, as general, had executed a bunch of his soldiers for insubordination. And so they had this long explanation. This is how out of touch National Republicans are, of like all the people that Jackson's killed. Do you think that hurt Jackson in the election? Of course not. People are like, oh, go Jackson, you know. Have some standards in the... Uh, it's, that did not hurt Jackson in the slides, but who's going to read all that? They also attacked Jackson on uh, his marriage. I told you before, his marriage to Rachel had been scandalous, not by today's standards, but they technically had been living together and having a romantic relationship while she was still married, so she was technically um, committing adultery. Now, Obviously, the way it happened wasn't a big deal, but at the time, that was pretty scandalous. Uh, that, that, was, that was a really painful one for Rachel. Now, let me ask you, what the hell are the Democrats going to attack John Quincy Adams for? This is a guy that wakes up at five in the morning to read his Bible and reads it three times a day in three different languages. What could they possibly have on him? And this is where they got really creative. At one point, uh, well, what they said was, John Quincy Adams procured for the enjoyment of the Russian czar 13-year-old American girl when he was a diplomat. Hmm. What does this mean? Well, the backstory of this, when John Quincy Adams was a diplomat in Russia, uh, there were Americans there, and Americans would send letters back home, and of course the Russian government would open the letters and read the letters before they sent them on. There was an American family with a 13-year-old girl, and she would write home letters back to her fam friends saying, here's what Russia's like, and the Russian czar was reading them, and he thought they were hilarious. So he asked John Quincy Adams, the American diplomat there, can I meet this 13-year-old girl? So John Quincy Adams brings the 13-year-old girl to the Russian czar. The Russian czar says, hello, 13-year-old girl. I'm the Russian czar. She says, hello, 13-year-old girl. They chat for a little bit, you know, with the parents there and John Quincy Adams there, and then they go their separate ways. Well, one of Jackson's supporters found out about this, and so they spread around a handle that said, John Quincy Adams procured for the enjoyment of the Russian czar a 13-year-old American girl. They're making John Quincy Adams out to be a pimp. The beautiful thing, and always remember this, actually Hitler said this, if you want to make a lie, you make it simple, and you just say it often. That's the formula for getting people to believe something that's incorrect. So the coffin handle, it's just way too many words. Ultimately, Jackson ended up winning, and he won overwhelmingly. Jackson won a blowout victory. Obviously, in the Electoral College, 68%, that's huge, but in the popular vote, 56% of the population, Jackson had the biggest, biggest popular vote victory in the entire 1800s in this election. He will have a bigger, bigger popular vote victory than Abraham Lincoln. He, it was an absolute blowout. So now we get Andrew Jackson as president, and he is. He, this election changes all elections 
after this, the formula will be continued. And now, all of, now we have a president who is a man of the people, first president to be elected who was not from a wealthy family. And he is a man of the people, a man of the common man, and he will represent the common man. Once Jackson won in November of 1828, before he actually got into office in 1829, his wife, Rachel, died. Died of a heart attack, I believe, and Jackson will insist she died of a broken heart. I can and do forgive all my enemies, but those vile wretches who have slandered Rachel must look to God for mercy. Jackson does not forgive his enemies, but he holds grudges and he holds them for a long time. He will especially blame Henry Clay for this. Jackson was absolutely furious. When Jackson was inaugurated, Jackson will go on to uh, promote that idea of being from the common people, a common man, and he will be the first president to open up his inauguration to everyone. Before this, it was always an invite-only occasion. Jackson is the first president to say, doors open, I'm a man of the people, everyone come on in. So as you would guess, 21,000 people showed up for this huge inaugural party. Everyone came. The White House was just flooded with people. Uh, people came from all walks of life and it was just, the White House was just crammed with people. When Jackson got there, it was so crowded he came into the door and he was like jostled around people, patting him on the back, congratulating him. And it was so crowded, he ended up with his back in a corner and people all around him, they couldn't figure out a way to get out. So he broke a window, hopped out the window, jumped on his horse, rode into Virginia and spent the evening in a hotel. Well, when you have 21,000 people in the White House, they don't just leave because the president left. So they stayed, and what do you think happened when 21,000 people are in the White House? They started stealing, and they started trampling over all the furniture, started breaking stuff. Uh, it was just chaotic. You know, there's like vats of liquor, and there, everyone's getting drunk, stealing. Just, it was a madhouse. How do you get 21,000 people out of, the, out of a house party? And this is good information for, you know, for if you're ever at a, kegger in college or something. Uh, at this point, obviously calling the cops is not an option. So how do you get 21,000 people out of the White House? You move the liquor. The party will always follow the liquor. So they took those big vats of alcohol, dragged them out into the lawn, you know, filled them back up, and then of course the party always follows the alcohol. So the whole party went out, they closed the doors, boarded them up, and the White House was trashed. Everything was trashed. It took thousands and thousands of dollars and years to fix this. This is true, and it's insane. It took longer to fix the White House from Jackson's inauguration, and it cost more money, than from when the British burnt it down in the War of 1812. To a lot of people like Jefferson and... Well, no, not Jefferson. To a lot of the older politicians, Jefferson was gone by this point. This looked like just absolute pandemonium. This is what happens when, to a lot of those older politicians, when you get someone like Jackson in office. And so Jackson's the president of the common man, and it was a common man's party, and it was wild.